Telehealth visits are also becoming a popular option for pet appointments. Regardless of why your pet needs to be seen, though, veterinarians say it is important to book that appointment as soon as possible and be patient. Well, many of us have been working longer hours, working from home during the pandemic. You're likely feeling burned out and stressed, but we're getting a reality check on the even larger impact this could be having on our health. And Denver Pride Fest will be police free this year. Why organizers say they are not allowed to participate. Thank you for staying with us. For Denver 7 News at 4, I'm Jessica Porter. Let's take a quick look at some of the stories making headlines across Colorado. Two Glendale police officers will be sued for shooting and killing a man last Halloween. John Pacheco was found asleep at the wheel of a stolen truck parked at Colorado and Alameda. He woke up, saw officers, and tried to get away. Prosecutors say he clipped an officer in the process. That officer and his partner then grabbed their guns and shot into the truck. The DA's office decided this week the officers had reason to fear for their lives and said they will not be charged. Attorneys say the lawsuit will be one of the first since Colorado eliminated qualified immunity for police officers. The Denver police officer whose gun was used to kill Isabella Thales has resigned. Sergeant Dan Politica said his friend Michael Close took the rifle without his knowledge. Thales was murdered last summer while walking her dog in the ballpark neighborhood. Her death inspired a law that requires people to quickly report lost or stolen firearms. Denver Pride Fest will not allow police officers to participate this year. The Center on Colfax says their organization and the Pride movement itself was born out of a response to police violence 45 years ago. It says it will stand with their allies with Black Lives Matter to push for racial justice. We've been talking about the disproportionate impact the pandemic has had on women leaving the workforce, and there are indications that trend could continue. Research from a global inclusion company found a majority of working women around the world, not just here in the U.S., say their work and home duties have increased. The women say they feel like they have always have to be on for work, and they don't feel like they're getting enough support from their employer on balancing their work and home life. Overall job satisfaction has dropped nearly 30%. Meanwhile, more major brands are realizing these problems and taking action. Nearly 200 businesses formed a coalition with a promise to make sure that women are not held back in the workforce. Companies like J.P. Morgan Chase, Uber, and McDonald's. The Care Economy Business Council will look into child and elder care systems, both of which families rely heavily on, to work. And we all know that working long hours can be tiring, but newly released numbers from the World Health Organization show just how serious that can be for our health. The agency is attributing 745,000 deaths around the world to working long hours. They say in 2016, more than half died from stroke and the rest from heart disease. All these people worked at least 55 hours a week and were between the ages of 45 and 74. But a workplace wellness expert we spoke with says we need to remember to look at all the things that led up to those more serious conditions. Sunday scaries has become a term, right, where you actually dread even going to work because it's you're, you know, you're you're overworked and exhausted from the long hours. And so the the shorter term impacts um, can also impact some of our health behaviors. Um, so poor sleep, um, smoking, alcohol use, an unhealthy diet. So those are the pathways that lead to those more serious um, health outcomes such as heart disease and stroke. She says if this is something you want to talk to your employer about, be sure and go into the conversation with a solution-oriented mindset. For example, if there's something that's causing extra work for everyone, how can that be fixed? Employers should also make sure their staff is taking proper breaks throughout the day and using all of their paid vacation time. This has especially been an issue during the pandemic. Some companies have even started using paid incentives so people will take that time off. Another issue is making sure employees have the proper resources to make the best use of their time at work. It's not just about the hours. It's also about the, the meaningfulness of the job. So, you know, employers can also think about how to, you know, not just focus on reducing hours, but how can we create high quality work that's meaningful to individuals. Dr. Allen says there's also work to be done at the federal level to help reduce long hours. Things like time off policies, 
paid parental leave and paid sick leave and even affordable child care. She says workers who have dependable child care are often less stressed and more productive at work. Meanwhile, the cost of child care is something that may put many families in debt this summer. A new survey from Bankrate says the average cost will be $834 per child. That will be for things like a babysitter, summer camp, daycare, or summer classes. Bankrate estimates 45% of parents will go into credit card debt because of those costs. More than half of parents surveyed have already changed their work hours or quit their jobs due to child care issues brought on by the pandemic. There's a push to make the technology to prevent drunk driving as standard as seat belts and airbags on all new cars. The woman that killed my daughter was driving 95 miles an hour on a city boulevard. The, the veering, the side swiping, the lane changing, any one, of, any one of the simple technologies that are already available on cars would have shut her down. The rare support this technology is getting from both sides of Congress. The world's unrecycled trash problem is largely caused by a few dozen major companies. A report by an Australian foundation faults several companies for more than half of all single-use plastic waste. U.S. brands like ExxonMobil and Dow are included. The report also points out most of the companies are using fossil fuels to make the plastics. And the major U.S. banks also play a role by lending money to these companies. At the same time, though, banks are committing more money to environmentally friendly projects. Bloomberg looked at bonds and loans since the Paris Agreement in 2015. They found that investments in green have steadily increased. And for the first time ever this year, money toward renewable projects and climate-friendly ventures has already surpassed money lent to the fossil fuel industry. At breweries across the country, these plastic tops are a key part of beer production and consumption. Problem is, even though they're recyclable, they aren't actually being recycled. I'm Chris Conti, and coming up tomorrow, we show you the efforts to make sure these plastic tops don't end up in landfills. But still to come today, the number of cases of unruly airline passengers is way up. I mean, one guy was punched in the head that I know. Who does that? Who just walks up and hits somebody and walks off? How more cases like this are making flight attendants reconsider their jobs. And Denver residents are weighing in on what they want to see replace the Park Hill golf course. Why some say the survey they took was deceiving. Next. On average, drunk driving kills 10,000 people on U.S. roads each year and causes 300,000 injuries. Now, it's not often we can bring you a story about a bipartisan effort in Congress. But preventing drunk driving may be one issue that unites both parties. As Maya Rodriguez tells us, a pair of bills are trying to address the problem using current technology. This photo says it all. A beaming Katie Snyder Evans, weeks after giving birth nearly four years ago, finally able to hold her premature twin daughters together for the first time. And the last time. On her way home from the hospital uh, one night after visiting the twins, she was hit and killed by a drunk driver. Katie's father, Ken Snyder, is on the faculty of Utah State University and now a technology advisor for Mothers Against Drunk Driving. I'm not an independent commentator on this topic. I am a, a grieving father. His latest focus? Two bills with bipartisan sponsors in Congress, the HALT Act in the House and the Ride Act in the Senate, which are looking to tap into technology to prevent drunk driving. And the goal is to mandate drunk driving prevention technology as standard as seat belts and airbags on all new passenger vehicles. According to MAD, there are currently 241 forms of vehicle technology, like lane assist or driver monitoring, that could be used to combat drunk driving by, in some cases, reprogramming that tech to safely pull an impaired driver over. The bills in Congress seek to create federal rules so that the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or NHTSA, could begin that process. It would require NHTSA to figure out what the best technology is. The bill is tech neutral, which means that they can look at all the different options and decide what they believe is best and then mandate that technology to be placed on all new cars. For its part, a major auto industry group says it would like to keep working on it. 
They declined an interview, but told us in a statement, quote, we share the goal of eliminating alcohol-impaired driving. Automakers are working collaboratively with the U.S. Department of Transportation and other stakeholders to develop innovative technologies that have the potential to prevent alcohol-impaired driving, a prevention that comes too late for many families, including Ken Snyder's. The woman that killed my daughter was driving 95 miles an hour on a city boulevard. The, the veering, the side swiping, the lane changing, any one of any one of the simple technologies that are already available on cars would have shut her down if only activated a possibility they don't want to see pass other families by in washington i'm maya rodriguez thank you maya preventing more deaths from cancer that's the basis for changing the age of colorectal cancer screenings that tops our news feed a preventative services task force has people to start testing at age 45 instead of the age of 50. That could include a colonoscopy or a stool-based test. A commission established by the president to study possible changes to the U.S. Supreme Court is having its first public meeting today. Right now, the high court has a conservative majority of six to three. The commission is looking to possibly adding more justices to the court and or including term limits. A ban against selling facial recognition technology to police is expanding. Amazon and other tech companies announced a pause last year because of claims the technology is biased and can incorrectly identify people with darker skin. Well, Amazon still claims its facial recognition is accurate, but some states and cities are also restricting government use. After a lot of sunshine today, we have some clouds moving in thanks to some thunderstorm activity off to our west. So as we go through the rest of this evening, we'll have a slight chance for scattered showers here for our area. Most of those will be off to the west into the foothills and the higher elevations. And you can see those developing now also across the eastern plains. We do have high fire danger for tomorrow out through western Colorado. And we also have a uh, flash flood watch down to our south, but not much happening here in Denver right now. We've had some very heavy rain south of Pueblo down toward Walsh and that flash flood watch in effect through the sea. Around 80 degrees through Thursday afternoon, upper 70s on Friday. A better chance for afternoon and evening storms on Saturday and Sunday, but then the sun is just back out with that drier air into the beginning of next week. We'll have 72 on Monday, 75 on Tuesday, and 77 on Wednesday with chances for afternoon and evening storms. Those overnight lows right around 50 degrees. Thank you, Stacy. This serene looking space is sparking intense debate in Denver. A developer snatched up the Park Hill golf course in 2019. Under current rules, it is limited to operating as an 18 hole golf course. Now the city is asking neighbors if they want to keep it as a golf course or change things up. The city worked with a market research firm to survey neighbors. Yesterday, that firm released some of its results. Four and five people want to see a mix of uses on the property. Some of the top things people want to see in that neighborhood are a grocery store, a park with athletic fields and affordable housing. Some have questions of their own, though, about the city of Denver survey. They're asking if the whole point was to influence opinions instead of collecting them. Denver 7's Russell Haythorn takes a look at push polls and how you can spot one. Special interests. You know what it's like during campaign season. And I approve this message. A barrage of political ads on TV, your computer, and even in your inbox. And then there are the phone calls, the online surveys, and the polls. There are also many, many legitimate polls out there. But DU marketing and consumer insight expert Ali Becherat says there are also marketing polls masquerading as political polls. There are sneaky, sneaky political activities. It is deceptive indeed. We're talking about what are commonly referred to as push polls. If you're mounting a push poll, it's because you're trying to get people to believe a certain thing. You're pretending like you're approaching it neutrally when in fact you have an alternative motive and a hidden agenda. Republican political consultant Daniel Cole says push polls cleverly pretend to want to learn about what you think when in fact they're trying to shape how you think. A push poll says things like, you know, if you knew that Drew robbed banks at night, would you still think he's a great guy? So that's a little disingenuous. The latest so-called push poll to stir up controversy was this one sent out by the city of Denver to supposedly gauge public opinion about what should be done with the Park Hill Golf Course, which was bought by a developer a few years ago and still sits empty, devoid of golfers and any real activity. This is the last 
largest piece of land in the city of Denver. And so that's why a lot of people are fighting so hard to preserve it. Lisa Calderon is Councilwoman Candy Cedabaca's chief of staff. Cedabaca recently blasted the city of Denver for its so-called survey on Park Hill saying, let's talk about push pulls. A push pull is a marketing technique disguised as a survey in which the true objective is to sway voters using loaded questions. The Park Hill golf course survey is stacked with pro-development questions as a pre text for extinguishing the conservation easement. You can never reclaim this space. It's gone. That conservation easement was voted on by Denver residents decades ago when Wellington Webb was mayor. It has a protection on it so that it's not supposed to have development, but because the developer bought this land, um, he is trying to develop it. Let's take a look at that survey, which some argue is a push-pull. One of the first questions, which statement do you most agree with? A, keep it 100% golf. B, repurpose the site for community serving uses, AKA development. Even if you chose golf, like I did, just to see where it would lead me, um, you are still pushed toward development. From there, the questions are mostly about development. What would you like to see on the site? A grocery store, retail, beauty and barber shops, and the list goes on. Very leading questions. We contacted the city who put us in touch with the company that developed the survey, RRC Associates. We don't have a dog in this hunt. Sean Maher with RRC says they've been doing this kind of market research for nearly 40 years. He defended the survey and said it is not a push-pull. Absolutely not. If a piece of information doesn't reinforce your agenda, you have to label it fake news or somehow discredit it. We don't have any vested interest in, it, in an outcome there. And I can assure you the city of Denver staff never directed us. They're so obvious about it. But it has clearly struck a nerve with Republicans and Democrats alike. It was a deceptive poll. To me, that's very valid criticism. Whether or not the city should be in the business, any city should be in the business of selling people on an opinion like this. Experts have some advice on how you can distinguish between truly unbiased polls and push polls. If you get a call, just simply ask who is sponsoring this research. You have to ask, okay, uh, why are you asking that question and why I have been selected? And finally, think about the length of the question. Bayshoret says true polls are lengthy and ask about demographics like your race, gender, and income. While push polls tend to be shorter and more negative, selling an opinion rather than learning yours. It's deceptive, it's incorrect information. That confused motive, I think is par for the course when it comes to advertising. As for what happens to the golf course. It will likely end up on the ballot. It will likely end up in court because the administration just isn't listening. Russell Haythorn, Denver 7. Misinformation about COVID vaccines is not just harmful to people's health, it's also big business. And very specifically, these are sophisticated. They're not individuals. These are companies, uh, 501c3s, LLCs, that web together and they, and they produce high quality misinformation that's designed to be as compelling, as shareable, as clickable, and as believable as possible. The chief executive of the Center for Countering Digital Hate, Hate is talking about who they classified as the disinformation dozen. That's 12 people who they say are responsible for 65% of the misinformation online. The nonprofit says the people are motivated either politically, psychologically, or by profits, and that they're selling an industry of doubt to people scared or hesitant to get vaccines. That allows them then to sell their own false cures, whether it's access to privileged information, access to false cures, um, access to, to their videos, their content, their books. And if they can latch, if they can distance people from the normal health authorities that they trust, well, and replace them, well, it's a big market for them to access. He says at first, major social media platforms said this sort of misinformation did not violate community standards. Only recently did they start taking action, but many accounts are still active. And the anti-vax for profit reach has grown by at least 10 million more followers during the pandemic. In a pandemic, the greatest gift you can give someone is good information. So go out and share good information that you see. Part of the problem has been that we're far too quick to engage with bad information and not with good information. And bad information often just to say this is nonsense, but still the algorithms that underpin social media platforms, as we've learned over many years, they reward only one thing, engagement, not factualness or public good.
You can follow the Center for Countering Digital Hate on social media to see the efforts to fight anti-vax profits. This week, the FAA announced a $50,000 fine against an airline passenger. That's after he tried to open a cockpit door and struck a flight attendant in the face. As more people start to board planes again, a new trend has started to emerge. Unruly behavior by passengers. As Dan Grossman shows us, it's causing some people to reconsider their careers. Being a flight attendant isn't a job. It's a way of life, it's a lifestyle. For five years, despondence was never a word Mitra Amirzadeh has associated with her career. I was shiny and brand new, so the whole world was beautiful. But over the course of the last one, as a flight attendant for one of our nation's major airlines, that has changed. I would say that I definitely saw the glasses being more three quarters full, not even half full, just three quarters full. Um, and nowadays I think I see it more for what it really is. Exhausting unfamiliar, demoralizing. I mean, one guy was punched in the head that I know. Who does that? Who just walks up and hits somebody and walks off? But it happened to him, so. In a typical year, the FAA says it sees between 100 and 150 formal cases of unruly passenger behavior. In the first five months of this year, the agency says it has received more than 1,300 reported cases. I've heard from a lot of my flying partners who have said this isn't the job that they remember. They don't recognize it and they can't take it anymore. As the international president of the Association of Flight Attendants, Sarah Nelson has heard more cases of these cases leading to that despondence as well. Even though we've had so many more incidents of unruly passengers, I believe that we would have a lot more people getting hurt and a lot bigger problems if we didn't have that clear instruction from leadership. Sarah's talking about the CDC and says most of the incidents she sees revolve around the masks they have mandated on flights, a simple requirement that has led to a flare in tensions and combatants. The FAA says of those 1,300 cases it is still reviewing, it has identified potential violations in at least 260 cases and has taken legal action, which can include criminal charges in more than 20. And then it's been this constant toll of um, an undercurrent of turmoil and conflict. And it's, it's not the job that we know. And many people have said they just can't do it anymore. They can't. It's not who they are. It's not what they signed up for. The FAA has announced it is now taking a zero tolerance approach to this behavior. Potential criminal charges, fines up to $35,000 per incident, and potential lifetime bans on certain airlines. So we become the punching bag. Um, we're the bad guy. We're the face of the rule. These flight attendants would more than appreciate if we could all comply so the flight is smoother and their passion for this career remains intact. And we have to de-escalate these issues because conflict gives rise to violence and that can put everyone in jeopardy. I'm Dan Grossman. And that does it for us today. I'm Tom Mustin. Denver 7 News at 5 starts right now. Demanding more. I feel like they think that they're above the law and they're the ones that are supposed to be protecting all of us. After the violent arrest of a 73-year-old with dementia, two of the officers involved are now facing charges. Austin Hopp used excessive force in the arrest of Ms. Gardner. Her family and attorney are pushing for more changes in the department. It feels like they're hiding behind this department. Plus a new push from Governor Polis to get Coloradans back to work. And lawmakers push to make sure third-party delivery services don't catch restaurants off guard as they continue to rebound. They had hijacked all of my photos, my logo, my name, everything without any of my consent. A family still upset and demanding more from Loveland police. By now, you've likely seen this police body cam video of the rough arrest of a 73-year-old. Her name's Karen Gardner, who walked out of a Walmart without paying for $20 worth of items. Well, today, the district attorney announced that two of the officers involved are facing criminal charges. But the family and their attorney, they're now questioning whether those charges are enough. I feel like the, the lack of empathy in the action of the officers that we're involved. This isn't just only affecting my mom and my family. It's also affecting this whole city of Loveland. Denver 7's Lance Hernandez is joining us live now from Loveland. Lance, clearly there, the family's still dealing with the trauma of all this. They're very distraught and they say that Karen has not been the same since the day of her fateful interaction with Loveland police. 
Now, she was arrested in June of 2020 following an alleged shoplifting incident. Body cam video shows her being taken to the ground. She was handcuffed up against the car and suffered a separated shoulder, broken arm, sprained wrist in the process, and family members tearfully told Denver 7 today the trauma she experienced on that day has speeded up her dementia. <laughs> Instead of embracing us, because we are her loved ones. She pushes us away instead of reaching over and just touching us to let us know she cares. She just pulls away. She doesn't smile since then. She just is so overwhelmed. We've talked to her caretakers about her PTSD from all of this and it has truly changed the progression of how her dementia was going. Now, it's rare that police officers are charged with a crime for their actions during an arrest. The 8th Judicial District Attorney says officers can use reasonable force in effecting an arrest, but they say what Austin Hopp did on that day was excessive force, and that's not all. The investigation in this case showed that Austin Hopp used excessive force in the arrest of Ms. Gardner, and that resulted in serious bodily injury to Ms. Gardner. Further, the investigation showed that Daria Jalali, having witnessed that excessive force, failed to live up to her duties under the law and as a sworn peace officer to either intervene or report in that, in that conduct. Not surprised by the charges. Uh, my reaction is we have two former employees that were charged with crimes. They do not work here. So our reaction is uh, extreme disappointment and uh, as a community, as a police department, as human beings here, we're very upset by it. That last gentleman, Robert Tyser, Loveland Police Chief. Now, Officer Hopp, the former officer, I should say, has been charged with second-degree assault, attempting to influence a public servant, and first-degree official misconduct. Daria Jalala has been charged with second-degree assault, attempting to influence a public servant, and also first-degree official misconduct. The family's attorney says both of those officers could have faced a myriad of other charges, including kidnapping. And she says that other officers who witnessed that video and said or did nothing should also be charged. In Loveland, Lance Hernandez, Denver 7. Thank you, Lance. Police are now looking for at least two men who tried helping someone escape from the Lookout Mountain Youth Services Center in Golden this morning. And their attempts to free 18-year-old Ernesto Antiveros using rocks and a rope thrown over the fence were unsuccessful. The suspects did fire a gun at least twice before they drove away from officers. No one was injured. Three Inglewood police officers have been released from the hospital and are now resting at home. All three were injured when they were hit by a 22-year-old man who was driving a stolen vehicle yesterday. Officers did shoot at that suspect who then later died at the hospital. His name has not yet been released. For three and a half years, the family of Maggie Long has been hoping and searching for answers. And now they are learning the FBI is investigating the 17-year-old's murder as a hate crime. And today we sat down with her family. They tell us they only recently learned about these new developments and still have no idea why their daughter was a target. And so, you know, you have to wonder then, why was the crime so hateful? Why did she die in such a violent, brutal manner? This is not a death that was accidental. It was completely intentional. And tonight, you will hear more from Maggie Long's family, who now hope about getting more answers. And we'll have that story for you tonight on Denver 7 News at 6. The Colorado Healing Fund is asking for more support. It's been just over a week and a half since six people were killed at a birthday party in Colorado Springs. Well, just over $8,000 has been raised so far to help. But a spokesperson tells us the families need more help to get through this tragedy. So if you'd like to donate, you can still do so online right now on the Colorado Healing Fund's website. Governor Jared Polis working on getting Coloradans back to work to rebound from the pandemic. And now he's giving workers a little bit of an extra push by offering money to those who get a full-time job. It's something called the Colorado Jumpstart Initiative Program. So essentially, Coloradans who are currently on unemployment could get up to $1,600 for getting a full-time job. To be eligible, you must have received at least one week of unemployment benefits over the past two months. And those who return to work by May will be eligible for that $1,600 check. And those who return by June could get up to $1,200. 
downtown Denver's rebound. It's been a little bumpy, but it is looking brighter. Today, the Downtown Denver Partnership released its annual report outlining the past year and the economic growth moving forward. Well, despite the pandemic, Close to 7,000 residential units were constructed in 2020. Also, downtown added 1,800 new hotel rooms and 2.8 million square feet of office space. Of course, like most major cities, 17% of downtown Denver offices are vacant right now. Also, downtown lost about 20,000 jobs and retail sales tax collections were down 42% from the year before. King Supers will lift its mask mandate tomorrow for both fully vaccinated employees and fully vaccinated customers. Parent company Kroger still asks those not yet vaccinated to keep wearing the mask. So Trader Joe's, Walmart and Target have now also dropped their mask requirements. The European Union finally opening its borders. EU leaders hope to allow fully vaccinated travelers back by June. Remember, even if you've been vaccinated, you still have to wait two weeks after your final dose to be considered fully vaccinated. And keep in mind, COVID-19 variants, they're still on the rise here in Colorado. On the state's main coronavirus dashboard, they're now including this graph showing which specific variants are most prevalent here in Colorado. And from the most recent data, that is still B117. That's the strain first discovered in the UK. It makes up more than 76% of all variant cases. We know there are so many questions still about the COVID-19 vaccine, especially regarding children. So that's exactly why tomorrow night I'm going to be hosting a town hall with Governor Jared Polis and state health leaders. 6.30, right here, right after Denver 7 News at 6. So please send in your questions if, if you have them. The email address is 360 at thedenverchannel.com. Well, food delivery services like Grubhub and DoorDash really became a lifeline for restaurants during the pandemic. But some businesses have been caught off guard after finding out they're being advertised without their permission. And now lawmakers are stepping in to stop that. Here's Denver 7 political reporter Megan Lopez. Every single one of them is handmade. If smell alone could build a business. There's a lot of love and artistry that goes into what we do here. Sugar Me Sweet and Highlands Ranch would be the model. We are strictly a dessert bakery. So cakes, cupcakes, cake pops, hand decorated cookies, which is what they're working on now. This basement business smells of graduation ceremonies, birthdays and weddings. And boy, is it popular. We're booking out two weeks. But around December, it got even busier. So I got three phone calls in one day from Grubhub people trying to order stuff for delivery same day. Here's the thing, though. Owner Kristen Marin had no idea her business was on the website. They had hijacked all of my photos, my logo, my name, everything without any of my consent. But what Grubhub was doing isn't illegal. This is a problem that we've been hearing from restaurateurs for years. The Colorado Restaurant Association says this can make businesses look bad. If I have food that needs to be kept very, very hot or very, very cold, you know, I may not want to offer that food for delivery. And customers were complaining to restaurants that had no idea their food was being delivered. They are trading on the good name of the business of the restaurants that they're delivering for. So Colorado lawmakers have passed a bill to give restaurants more control, requiring an agreement between delivery services and those businesses. I think businesses should have, have the ability to negotiate with other businesses that want to be distributors of their product. It took Kristen nearly a month to have her bakery finally removed. I had to go through their legal department with a cease and desist letter. I had to get an attorney involved. She's hoping this bill will make the process a little less bitter for others. Megan Lopez, Denver 7. And the State House passed the bill today and now goes to the Senate. DoorDash sent us a statement saying it supports the bill and then the company stopped that practice. Now Grubhub did not respond to our request for comment. Communities split in half. The effective footprint of the highway through these neighborhoods it is, it is about triple. Now neighbors are watching another major road project take place right in their backyards. It cut Swansea in half and, and divided and separated this area of the city off from the rest of Denver. We're taking a deep dive into the history of Interstate 70 and the communities that surround it. Plus the big payout coming for CU's president, leaving the job two years after his controversial hiring. Temperatures bounce back today, even warmer tomorrow, but will it hold for the weekend?